someone who wants to do harm is not going to be like, give me, our, oh, oh, never mind. He's a good one. He's Punjabi. He's not a Muslim. No, brown is brown. Hi, I'm Gracie Mercedes, and welcome back to Not Blank Enough, a podcast about everyday insecurities and triumphs. Today, I'm chatting with Parvesh China. The Indian American actor talks about his first experience with racial profiling, how 9 11 shaped his identity, and the model minority trope. All this and more in this lively conversation we titled Not Indian Enough. Welcome to Not Blank Enough. Thanks for being <laughs> on the show. <laughs> of course. Um, so let's just start at the beginning. Like, where yeah, are you let's go. from? Tell me about your upbringing. Gracie, I'm from Chicago, Illinois suburbs. So like my my folks, they immigrated late. Like they were early, like late 60s, like right, right around like 69, 70, or if not, definitely by 70. Because my brother's born in 71 and then I'm born in 79. Mm. But we're Chicago suburbanites. They already had moved to the suburbs by the time my brother was born. But they did the thing, city proper. And then because this is just now like fact, it used to be like this kind of like hidden, like kind of quiet thing. But no, my dad engineer, his coworkers were like, get to the suburbs. No one lives in the city. You know, the right. white, yeah. the white folks, because and this became a thing where um, I'm just jumping into it because I always I, I always think about this with the upbringing now. Yeah. Of course, part of white flight was also Asian flight huh. and it was delayed because. Uh-huh. As we know, white flight, GI Bill, thirty-year mortgages, uh, yep. redlining. Yep, they left, and yep. then when the, after the Nixon into Johnson into Nixon rescinded the Chinese Exclusion Act and all the, the, the we call it the brain drain. Mm. You know, when they needed more of the STEM, what we call now STEM, but back right. then it was just like doctors and engineers. Engineers, yeah. They made it to the burbs and it's still like it was a long time where even my dad is Republican. My mom is Democrat, especially after she got her citizenship. They always like fought about that. But like my dad was very much that thing of like he didn't understand like why black and Latino people in Chicago in the late 60s, early 70s weren't just going to the burbs, you know, and everything. So <laughs> that I, I remember always that like that they had escaped or. It was keeping up with the Joneses. They went mm. to Schaumburg Hoffman Estates, which the rich, rich suburbs are like the North Shore John Hughes uh-huh. suburbs, like uh-huh. Home Alone, right. 16 Candles. <laughs> this was inland of the lake okay. from there. <laughs> okay. And then we ended up in Naperville Aurora, which is basically like Wayne's World. Okay. And so that's like that. Okay. But that's where I'm from. I grew up in the burbs. I loved it. I loved it i thought really yeah i thought i thought yeah. chicago was the best our suburb naperville by the time that we had settled in by like third grade got like voted all these like number one places to raise your kids <laughs> number one places to retire and like of the, course. and libraries and so we like we didn't smoke we didn't drink until like college but like high school we're like no i i have to go to key club oh i'm so sorry it's senior directed one x you know, like wait, we were just, and so how old are you when you guys moved? You were pretty young, eight. Then, huh? You were eight, eight okay, eight, nine, yeah. Wait, where is your family from? First of all, India. I'm Indian, India. Ethnic, okay. ethnically Indian, and I'm I'm bringing this up because obviously the podcast. Uh, when uh, when you reached out, I was like, oh yeah, not Indian enough has been <laughs> the bane of my existence, right? As an actor, but then when it really hit, because like we were white kids, yeah, we, the way we you grew, grew up, up, yeah. I mean, like Indian, but also like our cultural identity was so like Indian because like of our parents. They spoke Mm -hmm. Punjabi, Hindi at home. We went to Gurdwara, which is like the Sikh house of worship every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And not even like to worship, like the kids, we'd play outside. The dads would talk politics. And I guess the moms would actually go to the religious service. Actually do the worshiping. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have other kids, though, in school that were Indian? Yeah. Like, and it got it got bigger. And by the time I do remember... And I was thinking about this even like earlier this month, like there was um, an Indian gal and there were some like Indian American kids who were very like integrated. Mm. Like my my friends were also mainly because they were in like classes with me, but they were we were all we all did choir. We all did mm. theater. 
mm-hmm. student government. So I'm like, I had friends with the joiners, you know, like the people who did things. Mm-hmm. Some of the Indian American friends were just like regular kids who didn't do much, you know, maybe one or two clubs. But I always remember one friend who was like Indian said to me like at the pep assembly or like school spirit, like, dude, Parvej, sit with your own race. Cause like her group of friends was here and I'm like, uh... But Danny and Priya and Rama are, I have to go sit with the choir kids. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> you know, but like, it was just that kind of thing of like, ah, yeah. um, uh, Anita or, or Smita, I forget her name. I was like, we, we, we're we doing that in yeah. 1996? Is in this a thing? <laughs> so, okay. So there were Indian kids who were doing the things you were doing as well. Like I'm assuming yeah. with the other white kids. And then there were the Indian kids who were only like hanging out with other Indian kids. Our suburb is pretty like white, you know, like th- this one, uh, like I want to say about 60, 70% white, but then about 20% Asian. Oh, okay. So like we grew up with that diversity. Mm-hmm. So there were yeah. the Indian kids who were only hanging out with the other Indian kids. Sure. And then there were the Indian kids like you who hung out with the white kids because you were involved in all these little groups. Yeah, we didn't think of our ethnicity. It wasn't the first focus. Right. You know, like my first focus was like, oh, I I, I do musical theater. <laughs> right. You know, like we, right. we have to learn South Pacific, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like it was that kind of thing. Like I didn't I didn't think about ethnicity as such a div- like as such a dividing or such a different thing mm-hmm. until college in 911. Mm. Oh yeah, tell me about that. Yeah. 911 was very interesting because you were still in Chicago? Yeah, I went to I went I ended up going to Roosevelt University for college for mm-hmm. musical theater. And I I gone to U of I downstate in Champaign Urbana for one year, but then I was like, "Oh shit, I'm in the middle of the cornfields and other friends we're going to DePaul, uh, Northwestern. They're auditioning for Taco Bell commercials at mm-hmm. 18. And I wanted to do that. So mm-hmm. I was like, come back. But I do remember like 9-11 happened. My mom even like woke me up. Because right, 9 a.m., I think New York was yeah. 8 a.m. Chicago when all mm-hmm. this was happening. And I was like, oh, she's calling me because she thinks I'm going to be late for <laughs> school. Or like, wake up, you know, right. or something. Right. And she's like, turn on the TV. And I was just like, I, had a, I was fortunate I had a car in my Chicago apartment. So I just drove back to the burb and stayed there for like a week. Oh, yeah. But yeah, cause we were just, we didn't know. That was that time. Like where we remember we thought like, Oh, the Sears tower, the tallest yeah, building in Chicago. We thought it was going to get bombed. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in New York, born and raised. I was there when the first time they tried to bomb the, the twin towers. 93. Yeah. 90, right. Yeah. The, yeah, at the, 90, at the basement. And I was living with a friend at the time, literally, this is such a quick, crazy story, but no, go for it. I was living with her because I was looking for my own place. And the day before September 10th, 2001, right. I was across the street from the twin towers signing my lease. Right. Cause the guy, mm-hmm. the landlord had an, uh, like an office down there. So signing my lease for this new apartment in the East village on 12th, uh, 12th street and like Avenue A. Anyway, my friend lives on 14th and 9th and this happened. She wakes me up. I'm like, holy shit, what's going on? My stepfather worked down there. So immediately I'm like, you know, thinking the worst, he was fine. The crazy thing is you can see the smoke out the window. The first one hits and everyone's talking about like, maybe the pilot was drunk, all this stuff. I immediately go to like terrorism bomb because I have this memory of the first time it happened. And then we find out, whatever, I can't move into my apartment for two weeks because everything below 14 is sure. shut down. My whole family lives upstate at this point. I can't go to them because all the Amtraks are shut down. So it was like, it's it's a crazy time. Anyway, my point being that I feel like I, I'm actually surprised that out of all the interviews I've had thus far, no one has brought up 9-11 ever. Right about anything but i guess yeah i want to see i want to hear like what it's was such that a effect? touchstone it's yeah. this moment where and now we think about it 20 years ago right this mm-hmm. this september will be the 20th for those of us like i'm 41 now mm-hmm. so that was college 20 i was yeah i was 21 excuse me because i'll turn 42 this july mm-hmm. so i think that's also why i was like annoyed with my mom i'm like oh, i've only been like going out to the bars for like a month or two at this point and i'm like she's probably calling to be like mm, are you at one of those gay bars i'm like yes <laughs> but it was that moment for me where we especially south asians and even back then we weren't called south asian we were east right. indian you know mm-hmm. or and we that's when i felt like 
like other. And my friend Winter Spears, who's a she's a stand up here in L.A. Yeah, isn't it? She she even she drove with me in 04, January 04. She was my friend who Mm. drove with me across the states. My, My one and only time driving from Chicago to LA. And I remember speeding at age 23, 24 Mm -hmm. and winter, like in the first five minutes being like, Parvesh, slow down. You are a brown man and I'm a black woman. Mm. (laughs) And, you know, Mm -hmm. and I just remember being like, you're right, you're right. I'll be, I'll slow, I'll slow down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But winter was also working with me at Chicago Shakespeare Theater. It was just like the day job, you know, like this was the thing back then before YouTube, if you were an artist, you're like, go intern at the theater companies in your town. Right. I was like, oh, I'll be a box office agent. So I was for a few years. And I was that suburban brat who would like go shop in between classes and work. So like, because Roosevelt is downtown, Chicago Shakespeare is right on Navy Pier on the water. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a gorgeous institution. They got a great deal from the city. I went to the old Navy on State Street, just like <laughs> shopping. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get some deals. Uh-huh. And I got, it was the first time I got followed in a Mm-mm. store. Yeah. And and I total suburban, I like with my bags of like shopping. Cause you know, the other ticket agents making eight bucks an hour yeah. weren't getting like allowances from their parents still in their twenties. <laughs> like I was right. so like, I needed a shopping budget. Yeah, And I walk in with those bags and I say to Winter, like, just so privileged. So like, there is a different privilege, you know, of that. And I was like, Mm -hmm. Winter, I got followed in the Old Navy. And she was like, Parvesh, welcome to being black. (laughs) I remember just being like, (laughs) what? I was like, I don't want to be treated like black people. (laughs) Oh my God. That honestly was my, because I know what that meant. Mm -hmm. That meant being followed in stores. That meant Mm -hmm. like, watch them, you know? And I always joke like that fear. It was like, no, you always had to watch the white people <laughs> like, for a while. Like my parents, both of them had um, general nutrition center, GNC franchises, South Asians, Indians, especially yeah. immigrants will jump on whatever the franchise trend is because if your friend is doing it, then surely you can do it and yeah. you'll do it better. Yeah. And so, so they had, had some, they did. And they, and I still did the say like, take like my multivitamin, vitamin D, everything. <laughs> They'd follow the the brown people. And then always the people who shoplifted, because even like two white kids my age from my high school, my mom caught them. Like she locked the door on them, grabbed one of them, one escaped. One was Mormon. And like the Mormon leaders came oh, to wow. talk to us to be like, he's a good one. And my mom was like, good, we're still pressing charges, you know? Wow. We ended up not, but because uh, I was scared even yeah. a bit at school. But it was just this thing of like, it was always the white kids who yeah. shoplifted. But right. also because you didn't, and not to say that all kids, it wasn't just all white, all black. Kids are kids. But the fact is that we always watched the people of color mm-hmm. over the white kids. So mm-hmm. then the white kids got away with it. All to say, though, like we, this was, 9-11 was that moment. And it's a two part because one, this is just still I'm still in school for acting. So it became that shift. And I had like four piercings. I would like, we were doing like modern, we did like a modern version of hair. And so set in like 2000, 2001. So I like had like purple and, you know, like our, the late 90s and early yeah, like 2000s. Yeah, like a punky, punk rock type of vibe. So I thought like, all right, I get to live like my authentic, mm-hmm. I'm going to get tattoos and everything. And I never have because they're after 9-11, they're like, what are you doing? take off your earrings. You're going to, and then like, you're going to work all the time as a terrorist or a convenience store owner. I'm like, great. I was like, yes, I'm going to (laughs) work. I just want to work. Like, oh yeah, I'll take your advice. Goodman theater director and casting director for ER in Chicago. I'm like, yeah, Yeah. I I should listen. Right. So that's that big shift where 2001 to 2010 was like very much like, oh, I guess I'm just going to be this We're going to be these stereotypical roles. Right. And then it's only in the last decade, I feel, where we're like, oh, you know, we can be more, we can be this, that. But it's taken this song and then even forget about any kind of creative element or like the arts. Mm -hmm. Take now this past Trump starting that kind Mm -hmm. of like boom reckoning to like, uh Mm uh-oh, this shit is real. The Tea Party all that element from the beginning of Barack's term was like, oh, maybe it's not just the fringe. Right. So, and then come to everything from George Floyd, Mm -hmm. just back in the news again with the 
with That's Chauvin's right. trial. Mm-hmm. This past year, though, 2020 was one where I'm like, it feels more and more like every ethnic minority targeted group, you know, the LGBT community, it all it starts to feel like we're finally all in it together. Yeah. Yeah. I think more, at least a more an, an acknowledgement of it. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying because there is such a pervasive racism within even people of color, mostly against black people, I feel like, but it, it yes. kind of, you know, it, it runs the gamut, but be, no, you're right, though. you know, Latina being Afro Latina, like growing up hearing people who look like me look black or are black Right. saying things about other black people or African Americans, you know, derogatory things. And I'm just like, you look exactly like them. Like, what are you talking about? But right. knowing that it's just this stereotype and this, you know, anti-blackness that's just instilled in us through white supremacy and all that. But I relate to so much what you're talking about because for me as as a kid, there was a little bit of a naivete or like, you know, sure. privilege of thinking, well, I'm Dominican and I, and I go to a good school and I live in a good neighborhood and I don't have to worry about these kind of things. And then yeah. as I get older, realizing, oh no, the world sees me a certain way, no matter where I come from or what my background is or how much money my parents make or where we live, like they're going to see you a certain way. And I've always had this innate feeling of being like having to to live up to like a, a standard so that people don't think of me in a certain way or like even now even now i'm like 43 years old i forget how old mm-hmm. i am I'm 43 years old going yeah, after 40 it doesn't matter it's like who cares it's, i'm in yeah. my 40s um yeah. when i go to a store i feel like so self-conscious of like not ever putting my hand in my purse or not mm. ever like like i feel like people are watching me or i'm going to be stopped or someone's going to same thing with driving like if a police officer pulls up behind me i yeah, like my heart course. instantly drops and it's just like this is fucked up and this is stuff that like people of color feel and go through every single day constant yeah it's just that innate i don't know thing and it's funny that you discovered it later in life Totally later. Even when I, I was a speed demon, like, cause mm-hmm. we learned, you got your license at 16 in Chicago. So like I got pulled over all the time, but it was always cause I was speed, I ran stoplights. Like I was, I was a good driver who just did shitty things mm-hmm. like on purpose. Cause I just, you know, you're invincible. Yeah. Team. And I remember there was one pullover because like I was driving my brother's car his license plate had fallen off the front, but I just saw everyone kind of like, you know, you'd put that license plate in the front, in the dash. I just yeah. thought the back one was the important thing. Mm. And I did get pulled over in high school. And the guy did say to me, uh, in America, we put the license on <laughs> the front. And I remember being like, oh, I know. Sorry, it just fell off. Like not even just being oblivious to the fact that like it was like a racial dig. I was just like, oh, I know. Sorry, my brother did <laughs> fell off. I thought you could put it here. You know, like it was just like these, not excuses, but just like over my head. And it wasn't until later that I was like, oh, that was shitty. But Mm -hmm. like, even like the idea of anything about like violence, getting shot, that only started happening in the last five years, five, Mm -hmm. 10 years. And I never, that never crossed my mind. I just assumed like, oh, you're going to get a ticket. Mm -hmm. You know, DWB, driving while black, DWI, Mm -hmm. driving while Indian, you know. It was all those. Like, we always just thought we got pulled over because they thought we were going to have like bombs in our car or like, you know, what you like weapon making. Not because they thought we were going to threat like the idea of like having guns pulled on you. Yeah. Get out of the car. Do this. Yeah. It never got to that. Even like that 2000s, that first decade of 2000s, that police brutality or violence was all about just like maybe you'll get your you have to be pulled out of the car. Mm-hmm. Remember, put your hands on the car like. Mm-hmm in stories how they'd always show like the guy on a date with a girl and then he'd be like humiliated rightfully so by that but no death no like body cameras being turned off before they shoot you in the back while you're running like Mm -hmm. that level wasn't there it was just still kind of an annoyance and awful but not the threat of death death. yeah it's so funny I, i don't know why i'm so nostalgic for like the 2000s, but like we mm. forget two decades ago. Yeah, like it was just interesting. Like the things that we worried about then were not yeah. as dire as they are now. Now it's really at a, now I do fear more so for safety. I've become like that. And I think part of the pandemic quarantine too is if you do get comfortable, if you're fortunate to mm. work from home, like I literally, Gracie, take this microphone back upstairs 
put it back in the closet where it goes into the makeshift voiceover booth of the last world so I can uh-huh. pay rent. So I've been very grateful. On the, then on the flip, I'm like, no, I don't need to go out into that scary world right now. I'm like, because <laughs> yeah. right now you don't get racial shit. You don't have to worry about driving and getting pulled over. Like all these mm-hmm. things, when you remove yourself from it, you're like, oh, the agoraphobes had something right. Right? Weird. Yeah, it's I'm I mean, I definitely am definitely an extrovert and miss being out in the world and out and about. And it's, it's yeah, it's driving me a little crazy. But I'm also kind of a germaphobe. And so like <laughs> I don't miss like I don't miss crowded places and I don't miss that part of it. So we'll see how I <laughs> re-enter the world now. But um you touched on it a second, but going back to the theme of the show, Please. how did you feel not Indian enough when you were growing up? I didn't because I maybe also being like closeted gay, not coming out to like, you know, the starting to come out until like 18, 19, you know, mm-hmm. I think late nineties was a thing of like, just, you know, our version of it gets better from the Trevor project was like, just wait till college. Don't come out in high school, <laughs> wait till college, okay. you know, write your poems in the literary magazine about being bisexual, but come out in college. <laughs> so it was that kind of thing. I always was like kind of rejecting my Indianness because they weren't very gay friendly, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. being Punjabi Sikh. Like I'm also like the runt of like my family's litter, like mm-hmm. Punjabi Sikhs tend to be the six, let alone even like the turbans for the, for the men who do keep their hair, you know, cause like there's different levels of orthodoxy too with the Sikh community. Like a lot of Bollywood stars cut their hair because they're not as religious. Just like some of our Jewish friends aren't like Orthodox Orthodox. or Lubavitcher, you know, there's different levels. So I already like wasn't identifying with them because they all played basketball. You know, there was a lot of identification (laughs) with hip hop and black culture. And I remember making the shift from like Belle Biv DeVoe and then like Nirvana. And then even (laughs) more so then it was like (laughs) musical theater. I'm like, oh my gosh, like let's, let's all sing Les Mis. Right. And do one day more and I'll play Thernadier. You know, I was always Thernadier. <laughs> so like, it was that kind of thing. Like my community was more like the acting art kind of stuff. I think if I told like my Indian community, like I love Madonna, they'd be like gay, right, you know? Right. I just, so the Indian side of me was already like identifying with like different things. It was like just so hyper-masculine and it was sports. And my, remember Chicago in the 90s, was the land of Michael Jordan. Right. My mom and I would fight because when we only had like one TV before like, you know, family started getting like the second one for Mm. the master bedroom. Whenever like the Bulls would be in the finals would be the same time that the Tony Awards would be on CBS. (laughs) So we would literally be like going back and forth. I'm like, I need to see Rent. Rent is going to be on. And they're like, Michael Jordan's going to win his third. I'm like, didn't he win three already? (laughs) <laughs> so like we wow. would fight like so do you see like my indianness in that regard was also like oh we have to go to gurdwara where they're going to speak in three four hours in the language i don't get about dogma and ideology that i don't really agree with or like don't even care because mm-hmm. i would just like i want to i want i need to go to i have tech mm-hmm. i have to go to like we're opening this show on next weekend mm-hmm. there's definitely a mix of i rejected a lot and then I just felt like, all right, I'm not belonging. So those of us who were like, oh, I'm just going to be this musical theater kid. Chicago was known. And I know we shouldn't, this phrase is even antiquated, but like they were known for their colorblind casting, right? Looking Glass, Chicago Shakespeare, let alone every little small off-loop storefront theater. Right. That's where we thought like, okay, TV film, hyper-realized. If it was this, you had to be that to play right. it. Theater, you can be anything, right? Yeah. So I did like that freedom, but after 9-11, after starting to work in TV film, my first film was Barbershop and I was the Indian convenience store owner. And I was like, all right, I'm good. This, this is what will be. But then it was this idea, like I had to be more Indian to get right. more work. Of course. So then like, you know how black people are tired of educating race. There is, if whatever you are of that race in for a period of time right now, before the people of color producers and writers and directors were there, you had to educate everything. You had to tell them like, no, these are different. No, uh, 
it, you should not put a Sikh Punjabi turban on an Indian guy who doesn't have a beard because then that would be weird. You know, Wrong. like that's yeah. incongruent. Just oh, stuff so like that. That's so interesting. Yeah. 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 And did you know you get- that. We always have to like educate like, oh, you know, you don't have to name the character Parvesh just because my name is Parvesh. <laughs> You know, it, it, we could have we could have kept the character Dave or Sanjay, <laughs> right? Or, you know, but like it doesn't have to be like, well, you're you're Indian. We'll just change it to Parvesh. We'll just I'm use like, your name. Cool. So, <laughs> yeah. Did you get the thing where like I know a lot of black people have gotten this before, where they're like, "Can you speak more urban?" Did you get the? Like, Can you speak more uh, or have more? Ours urban? is the accent game. Ours is the accent game for a while. Now I'm just like I don't I won't do it unless like two things. The money has to be really great. Mm-hmm. Because I am, I need to pay rent, mortgage, mm-hmm. right? The, the, being honest, like it has to be really good and a good project. Yeah, that's the joke. The real thing is, if yeah, if the character is like an Indian immigrant and it's 1992 and you're playing a 45 year old, yeah, chances are 45 year olds back then would have been more fresh mm-hmm. off the boat, fresh off the plane. Mm-hmm. We're joking. I'm talking to other friends. Like Rizwan Manji, Danny Pudi, these are like my best friends who are also like their family men, their Rizwan. dads now, mm-hmm. and they're great. And but they're talking about like you know, no one has seen us this age in the country, this American, the, at least in my, you know right now. Even the people who had been here before, like the 1920s, like my, I learned late in life that my paternal grandfather went to Berkeley in the 20s before. Oh wow all these like exclusion acts and everything. So like that blew my mind. I only learned that like a few years ago. Yeah. So my father never really spoken about his father. You know, like how if my grandfather, and my grandfather was like a communist. He was, he went to Russia. He knew Lenin. Like this, like he ran for office in India, like that kind of stuff. And I'm like, and then my dad's just an engineer. And he's like, why didn't you tell me about your dad being like political? <laughs> I, I think it explains why so many of us why at least even let alone other actors who are activists like wh- that explains like why i have this need to like in my free time help like social justice you know not yeah. just like oh i have that audition for the good place and then i have to go host this charity right yeah and, so, and that's such a good point that i haven't thought of with indian representation you're right anyone who's older automatically yeah. has a stereotypical like they have to have an accent they have to have a certain career they have like what we see on tv and film we just haven't been here that long and even compared because there was even like the indian man i think who went to court i forget it was scoted it for to supreme court but then they were like no you leave like that they literally got rid of people so it's different than like japanese and chinese immigrants who got to stay up until again, like internment concentration camps in the forties, but like they've been here longer. Like they're even more Americanized. Like we lost the native language. If I lost it because all my, my first up until age 20, it was American, American, American. We spoke English at home, no Mm -hmm. accent, blah, blah, blah. And then Madonna fucking ends up like doing ray of light and like having henna Indians in it's cool. I'm like, shit, I got to like learn my, whole language because now it's in you know like you spent so many decades like no i don't want to bring sog paneer to lunch mom go get me a lunchable the turkey you know like it was like you wanted to just fit in and blend in before then like later like oh my gosh you you're from india i've been to an ashram i'm like oh yeah i I haven't like it's just like you try to like you realize like holy holy shit all of a sudden like this culture is cool and in and then you have to learn everything about it because you spent your formative years divorcing yourself. From. Yeah. Yeah. I, my Spanish sucks because my mom was told not to teach me Spanish so that I See? wouldn't have an accent. And now I'm like yep. m- losing out on jobs because I don't speak fluent Spanish. And it's just like, it's the Gen on. X. It's yeah. the Gen X thing. The end of the baby Gen Xers, you know, they, we suffered from it because mm-hmm. it was a different thing before, like, no diversity embraced culture, you know, like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it it comes to that not Indian enough element and it's changing now. I feel like the last few years, especially because they're now there's a whole new generation, like the kids in their twenties, you know, the Gen Z Parkland generation, I don't know what name they are, but they are not standing for it. Mm -mm. And also luckily for them, there's more writer, producer, people behind the scenes to advocate for them too. Yeah. But we've always struggled. Danny and I talk about it 
all the time. We've like made it, we've even like tossed ideas like making like one, for like any of our sketch work, making a song like literally called Not Indian Enough. Cause we're too Indian for, to play like, again, those roles when it's just David right. or Joey. Like when friends say, like, have you ever thought about going to India? Even family, like go to India, work in Bollywood. I'm like, no, because <laughs> to them, we are too American. You're American, you know? yeah, yeah. I, I did like a workshop for Mira Nayar for uh, Monsoon Wedding, her movie that, you know, she's done a musical yeah. and it's great. My friend Anisha's in it. She's, you know, she's done productions and everything. But I remember doing a workshop and Mira just like making fun of my Indian accent. And she said, like, darling, this is not, you know, this is not for the white people, <laughs> you know, like that for the Goras, white people. And I was like, oh, damn it. <laughs> like, I call white people. For the, I love that. Yeah. We call them Gora women. white. But like up until this point, like I was like, I made my money with the accent. And now like this idol is telling me like it's shit. It's, right. Because it's like white good. people don't know the difference. But right, they don't. And but someone from India who's lived all over the world and mm -hmm. Africa, India, like, London. Doing? Yeah. So that was that was heartbreaking. But I'm like, got it. I, I can't pretend to be that either. So yeah. when you ask even like, are you an actor first or everything like it's all shifting because I don't want to necessarily play characters anymore. I like playing myself. Mm. No, you get I, it? Like I, I, I like, totally get that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't need, if you need a, tr go hire Riz Ahmed for yeah. if you need oh. someone to really transform. And I love Riz Ahmed. Can but he can do Riz that. Ahmed he's, <laughs> yeah, please, because he's brilliant. He's, he's so brilliant. brilliant. He's so But great. I can't do what he does. And yeah. I'd rather just be me because that's the thing of like, that like you are enough. Oh mm -hmm. God, so hokey. But like you're enough like no, to, just to show like Indian American, gay. And sometimes like that's, already enough well, it is enough and it's also showing the world that there isn't just this indian monolith or this gay monolith and that you can be who you are and it doesn't have to fit into what we've already seen on tv i feel like you know for latinx community that's also prevalent where it's like the constant need to tell these like first generation stories and these like coming to america stories and it's yeah. like can we get beyond that and just have a story with a Latinx family, that's just about them being a Latinx family and who they are as people and not so much about like where they're from or like why they're different because they're from there. You know what I mean? Like we have so yeah. many shows about white people that are not about them being white. So like, why can't we have shows about other ethnicities that's not about what their ethnicity is, if that makes I've sense. I've been watching the real world reunion from the first season. Have is you? Oh, no. Oh my gosh, it's on Paramount Plus. It's everyone. Eric Nee from the first Eric one. Nice, oh my god, Heather B. Oh my god, Kevin Powell, Julie, they're all there. Uh -huh. And I'm I'm thinking back to that time a lot. And I've I noticed like I because again that's that nostalgic time. The first time you saw gay people, you know, mm -hmm. people interacting. The the idea of like just being enough, being yourself, is still kind of new. Like mm -hmm. you're always still like kind of. I felt like even back then, just pretending to be different to mm -hmm. get in. But I think Kevin said something, Kevin Powell, who's, again, a writer and everything, he mentioned about, like, white people haven't had to think about these things, but every other race always has to account for white people in their story here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have to know what they do, what they say. So, like, that's why we're always kind of have our eye or ear, even, like, in these first generation, the stories have to, it can't just be the Latinx family being, mm -hmm. because they can't exist that way. They have to still be in relation to the dominant culture here. Mm -hmm. My pendulum swings sometimes. Like there are times when I don't want to be like that, that not blank enough, not Indian enough, not American mm -hmm. enough. Like it's another thing, like let's do a thing like where we don't ever talk about our Indianness. I also now have like started to shift away from that mm -hmm. where it's just about the balance. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not going to be like every episode. Wow, that color reminds me of <laughs> uh, chicken tikka masala colored. You know, like not everything has to be that lens <laughs> right, through a cultural right. thing. So I just feel like where we've seen the things where it's like every joke, you know, back in India, I remember my parents would say, that, you know, as that set up for the joke for the Tony Shalhoub character on Wings, even, you know, you always have to come through that lens of other. So it's not, I like it when it's just the shows, like, I remember Sorry You Blues show, I Feel Bad mm -hmm. on NBC, where like Asim Bathra was the showrunner. And there's this one moment where her mom, Mother Joffrey, is washing 
the like the Ziploc bags out and putting mm-hmm. them on the drying rack. They don't talk about it, but I was like, yep, that's ethnic. I don't know if that's right. Latinx or Indian, but they're her just doing it and showing mm-hmm. it. That's enough. Exactly. And that's, that I think was that's, enough. that's more of what I mean. Cause it's like, you're always going to have that infusion because that's who you are. Right. And so we do yeah. things differently. We cook different. We have these different approaches to thing, but we don't have to like point it out and talk about it and have it no. be the, the whole premise of the show, which is what. Did you see Vida, Tanya Sriracha? Yeah, I love show. that show. Right. I love so that, that show. Do you remember when they talk about like how to eat a taco mm-hmm. where like you move your head to the taco, you don't mm-hmm. move the taco to your head or face that, and I, that, that stuck with me yeah that's such a great example too because there was another time it's also food related they were eating this uh-huh. thing they looked like fruit and it had a bunch of and it wasn't the fruit that you see in the in the carts on the corner where they just put sure. the like tahine on it it was something yeah. else it was like more red and more like it just looked different and i can't remember what they called it and i remember being like so fascinated by it because i'm like even that, that's so specific to Mexican culture. Like I'm Latina, <laughs> but I'm not Mexican. I'm Dominican. So I have no idea what the hell that is. And I'm sure there's Dominican things that they don't know what, you know, and it's just like that. I love, like, I love the specificity without it being, look, this is about this thing we're doing or eating right now. Like they didn't explain it. They didn't talk about it. They were just eating it. You know what I mean? And it's just like, yeah. So that, that to me is my favorite kind of storytelling where it's, specific to the culture, but it's not like we're pointing at it and saying, Hey, Hey, look at this. Look how different we are. So we've had, sorry, you on our show, by the way, I wanted to have, yeah, she's great. He was she's one of a, our early guests. Like, I think she was like episode four or five and she's, she's fantastic. A she's also like now she's become like leading woman. She's leading the chart yeah. and she's playing a lot of these, like, yeah, she doesn't fit into those boxes, you know. She- no, we talked about that with her. I mean, her her um, episode was more of a focus on, um, I think, colorism within the Indian community, which sure we could all because she to. is darker. Yeah, because she's darker, she, and she is absolutely darker than the Punjabi northern paler that I am. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. And Go ahead. That's and that has nothing. I mean, like all we do, and then we see that here in America is like what nothing, and then then we learned like about caste system back in India, like, oh, that's where that from. You put, you assign this weird racist class thing on the color of skin or where you're from. And then to learn about it in the black community is fascinating. I remember like you were talking earlier about the not Indian enough element. Like I remember auditioning for BET for, and it was an all women producers, like it was high up. And they asked me to do like the elevator guy or doorman do it with an accent and i said no i'm not getting the paper bag test here at bet am i and half of them were like laughing and the other half were mad still face because you, you know have you mm-hmm. heard yeah everyone, yeah i know that like, the paper bag some people know fact, the paper bag test gonna, about are out. you darker than this are you yeah. lighter than this you can be in the, the the joke that we always knew was like if you're lighter than the paper bag the, the brown lunch paper bag you can be a mcdonald's commercial if you're darker you have to be in the specifically black or urban one you know like oh did you hear about calvin calvin's got a job he's working at mcdonald's i always remember mm-hmm. the calvin ad because mm-hmm. it was the one that was like so specific to just everyone was black. And as like a child, I was like, why? Oh, everyone's black in this commercial. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's funny because, well, there's two things. I want to first shout out um, Mama Ya Aforo, who was also on our show. And she has this amazing short called Paper Brown Pageant. Wow. Um, or, Or is it Paper Brown Bag Pageant? I think it's called Paper Brown Pageant, but it's, it's, you know, it's a beauty pageant about colorism and it's wow. fantastic and it's a great short film. But then also, um, yeah, I, I know a lot about colorism being <laughs> the yeah. color that I am um, and how it's so funny because in the black community, I have like a privilege because I'm lighter, lighter skin, but in the Latin community, I have a disadvantage because I'm darker skin. So it's this yeah. like, I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> It's like it's all the relation to whiteness. It's Isn't just so freaking ridiculous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I totally get it. Okay. So to close out our conversation, how are you feeling today? Like in 2021, what are you up to? And is your blank still not Indian enough? Do you still get that today? I do. I still think that we'll always get it. My fear now with hyper actualized casting is that I joke about like outsourced, which was my big break TV wise, which was set in India. And it was all, again, like Rizwan, Indian-Canadian, 
me, Anisha were American. And then we had two Brits, two British, Indian British folks. And now we joke like, oh, nope, they will cast everyone from India now for that. And I guess kind of rightfully so. If, right. if you're playing Indian born, right. why not? Yeah. But then we just have to keep making, I'm just trying to keep making space for like, I like the connecting was my last show on NBC. It was one of the pandemic shows. And I was just yeah, like, I watched it. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I I'll was just take- so curious about like how they were going to pull that off, but it was really good. That it's it was done here. I filmed yeah. mainly in our laundry room and they just sent equipment. They just literally sent equipment. My partner, Crazy. Eric, would help when he wasn't working, but w- we were alone. And but it was it was fine because like I, I liked it. I kind of like the control of like I can I'll do my own microphone. I'll do my own makeup. Yeah. And it's but- such a I mean, honestly, it's just such a cool experiment for the time. Right. Like you can no other show did that really. I mean, there's a couple of shows. Couple of couple of preform. quarantine shows, but I feel yeah. like they're all gonna be in this like time capsule of like, okay, you yeah. guys did that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and I I like it because again, I liked working from home. I didn't have to go out, but I would like have full, full work days. Like it was like 10, 12, like just like shooting single cam, but instead of it being like 10, 12, 14 hours because of travel and commute, mm-hmm. it was like eight. It was like mm-hmm. just a full day at home, and then you wash off and change in your pajamas and you're in bed. So crazy. But I did so. like it because like it's the closest character I've played to myself, mm-hmm. like a, a gay partnered man. The character had kids. I don't, but I'm a good, I love kids. I'm a good gunkle. <laughs> so like it was close. So I liked it. So I do feel like it's always better today than it was yesterday. Mm-hmm. And especially in the industry, even like when I think of like voiceover work, which I just love so much because now even talk about let alone that they're even casting more authentically, ethnically, which is great. Mm-hmm. But also, like, we can still play. Anybody can be a cloud. Anyone can right. be a dinosaur. Anyone can be a rock. Right. So that's what I love. That's what mm-hmm. I love about, like, it's that diverse and open where I, I do understand why some voiceover people don't show their photo or their image in their materials because they don't want that. Oh, that's smart. They don't want their ethnicity or anything to mm-hmm. cloud them not getting work. It's funny you say that because I, I stopped doing voiceovers because of that. My commercial agency is a big voiceover agency. Uh-huh. And so for a little bit, they were like, you should just come and try to do voiceover. This is pre-pandemic. Sure. And I so I didn't like that I had to like drive. I always had to drive to the agency to, to, to audition. I was just like, oh, this is annoying. I was <laughs> being such a bratty <laughs> actor. Little did I know what was coming and I should have yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> taken it when I could. But one of my biggest pet peeves was kind of the opposite where it was like, I would only go in for African American voices. Sure. And then they would try to make me sound quote unquote more urban in a sense, because to them I didn't sound black enough, I guess. And that would really infuriate me to the point where the the one thing I, I did book, and after that I was like, okay, yeah, I'm not doing this. The one thing I did book, I won't say the company. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I won't say the company. Yeah, because we have to keep working. Because I want to keep working. <laughs> The, the dialogue was clearly written in a way that you wanted to, they wanted you to sound quote unquote urban, right? Of course. And me and the guy who went in together, we were talking about it and kind of making fun of it. Another black guy, he was like, why don't we, why don't we really do this? They want us to do this. Why don't we really do this? We're like, okay. And we put on the most like urban black voices you can possibly put on. I was just like, sure. talking the way I, I would never talk that way, but I was like, okay, let's do this. You want me to do this? I'm going to do this. We both booked it. Okay. No. And we were just like, <laughs> oh my God. And then at the, uh, at the um, recording of it, the director who was black, literally the first thing he said, he's like, all right, guys, we know what this is. So let's just do it. And we just, and we were just like, oh, wow, this black director, he even knows that they're, yeah. that these white clients want us to sound a certain way. So let's just make them happy and, and cash this check and move on. Right. But there was something so icky about that for me that I was just like, this is not cool. And it's like, I get we want to work and I get why they do it. And I get there's some people who do sound like that. So maybe they should get an actor who actually sounds like that instead right. of making if you're, someone. If, if that's right? your natural voice. If that's or your natural, natural voice and your natural dialect. inflection and your natural yeah. accent. Great. Cool. I got no problem with that. But to me, it just felt icky to be like, put this voice on, speak this way so we can sell this thing to that community. And I don't know, it felt very inauthentic to me. And I, and 
I can see people seeing like, but you're an actor, just fucking do it. And I, and I get that part too. And some people right. are okay with that. But for some, th- for some reason, for me, it felt icky. And I was like, can I just audition? Can you just listen to my voice and decide if you like it and not worry about what color my skin is or what my background is? Yeah. There's that p- part too. It's like everyone has your choice too, of like what you want to do or whatnot. And the question is like, but should they be making this kind of product anyway? And then also like white characters when they're playing lower education or, you know, this person doesn't have this. Cause like we have to also, we minorities also, we're always put upon like, you have to be the best. You have to be the smartest, most educated, show your culture in the best light. Exactly. So then you get these sanitized, maybe not authentic depictions of the story you want to tell. And I get it. A joke for a commercial. No, no, no. That's a bad thing. But like, if you're actually showing like, Oh, the immigrant community that didn't that wasn't well off or didn't get money or just a story in that regard where someone might talk with those kind of urban dialogues or a little bit more accent tinged depending on how integrated they've been i want to also acknowledge and make space for those where it's not a joke but i get fearful of those because i don't like it's that perception i'm a comic i play lower status class characters because i'm also forget about ethnicity. I'm also a short guy. I do. I just like play <laughs> weak nebbish assistants better than I would like a sex kitten, you know, or something. And that's fine. So like, I just want to, you know, we get, there's that danger of like, okay, can we ever show like these stories of downtrodden right. or uneducated people? So that we're at that mix too. We're not yeah. all upper middle class educated either. Right. Right. And that's it- that model minority myth that they that white supremacy put on it because like oh i remember even at like my high school graduation some parent telling my some friend dad of my friends telling my parents like you guys were one of the good ones oh, what boy good what immigrants minorities like he was not shy about it and he viewed it like he was giving us a compliment and i think we probably took it as one we're like oh, oh yeah good yeah yeah oh yeah we're not like we we don't, we don't do weird things or bad thing. It was that alignment with it. And that's even when you talked about like the, I think earlier you had really mentioned like about the, like the Brown thing. I think about a lot of like the South Asians, Brown people, like remember the, for every Kamala Harris, there was an Ajit Pai, a Seema Biswas, who was the head of Medicare under Trump to, you know, Rod Shah, who was the assistant to Sarah Sanders. There's a lot of Indian South Asians who still align with Republican thinking and being like the, they talk about the legal immigration. They they just don't see that they were allowed a freedom and a fortune that again, black and Latinx people who've been here, mm-hmm. you know, not by choice, not by, you know, by invasion, you know, like the native to the slaves, like it's a different history versus my dad, I want to go to America. Well, guess what? You can come back in. Or you're an engineer. We'll set you up in Chicago. Right. Have a good life. Right. So that's where I feel like there's still so much reckoning and acknowledgement happening. And it's still always better to be now because still today, there's just m- many more when I just think of like reviewers and not just like the writer, director, actor. I mean, it's producers, it's critics, it's marketing, it's publicists. So it's becoming all inclusive and the allyship between like, you know, Asians for black lives, you know, um, black trans lives matter. It's it's becoming that specific and inclusive yeah. for everybody. So I do feel like the Asian hate right now, like uh, the best advice and things that I think some of my, like the community organizations are learning from are learning from the black led organizations because there's nothing to, no one will win if we're all just like, don't care about them. I remember like this has happened with certain brown communities, like, but we're not Muslim. I'm like, mom or aunt, some, you know, they're not going to care if when when someone who wants to do harm is not going to be like, give me, are, oh, are oh never mind. He's a good one. He's Punjabi. He's not a Muslim. Right. No, brown is brown. Like yeah. when the battle comes, like, and I hate to use it, these silly phrases, but like, I always just feel like no one's going to check. No one's going to be like, no. oh, let me let me see where you are. You look different. You look like someone I should hate, but let me just check your papers first. I um I totally get that because that's my frustration with the Latinx community because it's the same thing. These brown and black or darker Latinx just being like, well, no, but I'm I'm Puerto Rican or I'm Dominican or I'm Cuban. It's like 
No one cares if, if you know, when you walk care. down the street, they don't see, they don't think you're different. And I mean, there is that privilege to the white, whiter Latinxes or white passing Latinx, right. of course. But for anyone who's, you know, an olive hue or darker, they don't care if yeah. they're going to hate on you. They're going to hate on you. They're not going to check for us to see what you no. are. The Republican women, the two Korean American women who like they flip back to seats in Orange County back to red. You know, Michelle Steele and I forget young, I forget the other one. And I'm like, and now they're complaining, of, of course, of, about their fellow Republican congressmen doing all the Asian coded, you know, euphemisms for the coronavirus. And they're shocked and they're outraged. I'm like, what party do you think you're a part of? Yeah. I mean, like, I don't want to like tell anyone who's ethnic not to be conservative or right leaning, yeah. but like when it when it is all said and done. Your party's values are against you. Yep. It's You're just voting that against simple. yourself. You're voting. Yeah. Yourself. I'd rather be a part of like the Democrat versus progressive socialist, democratic socialist schism versus dealing with people who are like your base wanted to overthrow the government on January 6th. I don't think that they're going to be really open to Asian hate. No. Michelle Steele of Orange. I mean, like, yeah. Do you see how bad? But then she also has like she's very homophobic. She took her daughter out of a school because um, oh there were gays there. M mind you, can you tell like who I'm targeting? Who we in California need to target? I cannot believe that they they went back to red in 2020. It's, it's I, after yeah. being blue in 2018. So it's yeah, maddening yeah. to me, it's, and it's more maddening as an Asian American who is liberal and progressive to see other Asian women be the like the token or the propped up thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like, that's very frustrating because that's where I'm like, yeah, there's more of the Asian lives for black lives and all of us together, but there's still holdouts. Yeah, no, for sure. There's still definitely yeah. like, they're the people who are like doing the homeless camp sweeps. They yeah. don't want to do the, the nuanced, complicated solution. Right. They want the quick, easy, get them out of the echo park. Yeah. I don't want to see them answer. Yeah. yeah. Or the wash or like the basin washes in orange County. It's, it's fascinating. And if anything, I'm leaving with like a focus today of still there's national shit. There will always be this is not 2009. This is not 2010 where we now in our 40s, but back then in our late 20s, Obama's in. Racism is solved. Goodbye. I'm going to go right. focus on my career and finding love now. Yeah. Now we're older and we're like, OK, Biden's in. Kamala's there. We still got 2022. Still got a lot of work up. to do. Yeah. Still got yeah. a lot of work so to do. I do leave knowing that. I'm going to be acting a lot locally mm. in terms of politics because I'm like, when people say like California, you guys are so liberal progressive. I'm like, really? We took away <laughs> gig workers ability to get health care. Yeah. I think people, and it's similar in New York where it's like New York city is, city? <laughs> the city? is liberal. Yeah. Um, Go, LA and Poughkeepsie? San Francisco are, are liberal, <laughs> but you know, outside of that, there are big, it's a big state of New York. Yeah. It's a big state of California. And there's a lot of red in both of those I states. always think in New York, like Poughkeepsie is, mm -hmm. it, it has Vassar, mm -hmm. but it's Poughkeepsie. <laughs> yeah. Where my family lives in Rhinebeck, you know, Rhinebeck has become kind of a hip town now. So there's a lot of um, progressives and liberals coming up from the city living yeah. there. But you drive a little, you know, a one mile in one direction and you'll, and there was plenty of Trump signs for the last, you know, eight years when, when, when I was going home and I was just like, oh, I do find that the suburbs are finally tilting progressive blue left whatever because i think it is people like our peers in their 40s again anyway. from like cincinnati to chicago let alone new york la who are moving outward or like we are we're moving to um outside long beach and because it's close but still yeah. a little further like we want a, a yard from the city, city yeah. yeah a little removed but like i know that Oh, that's a conservative. It's a little conservative down there too. The border of Orange County. Yeah. I'm like, great. Guess what? Interracial gay couples coming your way. <laughs> hey. <laughs> but I think mean, that We're even here. that kind of like ownership and thing is something. Yeah. So like just to show, like I didn't think b before marriage equality in 2015, let alone even when Obama, I just never thought I would get married. Yeah. So like the fact that that's a possibility in real just shows change. From like, you know, we focus a lot on like the early 2000s, 9-11 yeah, was that yeah, yeah. shift of that like shift. where identity for so many of us, specifically like the brown people who looked, if you might have Muslim, 
you know, you might be a Muslim uh, faith. Mm -hmm. That was that moment of like, not American enough, not Indian enough. And I do think that it'll still be another generation. I feel like it's like my friends who have kids, by the time they have kids, like Rizwan, Munji's like grandkids. Yeah. I think it'll be, they'll be looking back and be like, why did you guys let Trump happen? <laughs> you know, they'll they'll look back at that. I really, that's what I have hope uh, for. I hope so and, too. I really do. And these, I, like, I think not so bl too. blank enough yeah. issues will just become, you can be both. Yes, I, I love that. I think that's a lovely note to end on with some optimism. <laughs> and yeah, we'll definitely be calling this not indeed enough. And it's true. Thank you so much for being on the show. This was Gracie, awesome. a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Not Blank Enough with me, Gracie Mercedes. You can find out more about today's guest in the show notes. Please subscribe to Not Blank Enough wherever you get your podcast, and follow us on Instagram at Not Blank Enough Pod. Also, if you like what you hear, please consider a rate and review. Our show today was executive produced by Gracie Mercedes and Dave Hill, and produced by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Not Blank Enough is a Gumption Pitchers production.